Just quick introductions. Uh, Cable uh, Green is the director of Open Knowledge at Creative Commons, um, and uh, I, I've been. I think I've known Cable for a while. When I, I think, did this before. Asked him to quickly come out to, when I was at the University of Massachusetts. To we had a meeting of provosts, and I thought, oh, if I can inject some OER discussions into this, I yeah sort of last minute he accommodated me then. I, I'm sure he thinks I'm a bit of a flake. Um, but uh, he's a Creative Commons, and um, I think his discussion will be great um, talking about an initiative, um, and specific initiative, um, raising questions about how are those identified, when to act, when is it something that um, warrants an organization's um, adoption and, and, and resourcing of that initiative. Um, Deb Bryant, uh, I met, was actually the chair of the, the um, hiring committee of the OSI when I uh, first joined. Um, and she already knows I'm uh, unorganized after working with me for 12 years. And so this was nothing new, the last minute call to join us. Uh, but Deb has a long career in, in open source. Um, I think it, her dates back to her time at Oregon State with the OSL Lab, uh, which is a hosting and infrastructure support for open source projects run out of the university. It serves as both an academic and um, infrastructure service uh, for the campus. Um, but she's uh, most, for her current role, she was in the uh, open source program office um, uh, at Red Hat. Um, she's a policy wonk, is I think that's a compliment for open source in both US and Europe, but is now working with the OSI as the director of US policy. Um, so I think both, you know, she'll provide a great um, sort of perspective on external drivers that are impacting, I think, the way uh, open source, open initiatives, open resource uh, organizations um, are working today and what's influencing those, um, the organization and the operations. So uh, I think it's a great start. Um, I think the format today is both uh, uh, Deb and, and Cable will do a quick inter or not quick, but uh, do about a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute presentation. And then uh, we have questions. We've, we've scraped the questions from the registration um, that folks provided. And then I'm sure there'll be quite a few uh, afterwards. So about 20 minutes after that for questions. So without that, I'm not sure who I put on the hook first to go first. Um, but I will let the random number generator of uh, the which one's listed first in the pop-up, um, if that's okay, decide. And uh, uh, there we go. Oh, so Deb, um, if, you're, if you're okay, um, I'd like to hand the floor to you. Sure, why not? All right, well, so I'm going to try to keep my comments relatively brief. I'm going to do a little bit of stone skipping on some topics, uh, and then we can just as a group things that you're most interested in. My focus today is going to be around what's happening in the public policy area and, uh, and, uh, and, and a little bit in research. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing myself. Uh, Patrick, I appreciate the, the um, introduction. And I also want to thank for being here. I really appreciate uh, the work that Aperio Foundation does. I've had the privilege of keynoting at some of your events. And I know a lot of your community. So you're a wonderful asset uh, to higher ed. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, here's, our, here's our little 15-minute agenda. Uh, I'm going to conclude with what keeps me up at night. Those are Patrick's words. I usually would say gaps, but these uh, I, I, I want to wrap up by thinking about areas we need to be concerned and pay attention to uh, while we still celebrate some of the process, uh, progress we've made and what some of the public discussions are. Can I go to the next slide, please? So today I've got quite a bit of focus on public policy, uh, a distant place from where I was 15 years ago, I've been involved in operational policies for government operations for a long time. But uh, in the last several years, uh, the, the topic of open source has kind of exploded in the field. Part of the driver is that although we've known that open source has been used in the public sector for some time, and there's been some degree of policy around how to consume or collaborate in open source for public sector organizations, the pandemic was a huge driver 
and really increasing the participation uh, uh, in open source projects. And, uh, and we've seen a lot of research around that too. So that's accelerated some of the public interest and put it on uh, the radar where it hasn't been before. Uh, in the last several years, the US government has certainly had more of an issue as they created a federal open source code policy with an interest in uh, converting uh, custom developed code to be released as open source, you know, it's had some some success, some level of success. And the European Commission has been much more aggressive in building open source into their roadmap uh, a, as a strategy to lever innovation. They would like to become more participatory in the software economy and also uh, as a, a feature of their digital sovereignty uh, philosophy. Today, in the last year or so, and, what, and the conversations we're having today are very much driven by visibility in solving some of the world's thorniest problems around cybersecurity. That's both uh, in, in fraud and crime and also nation state players and active use of, of uh, software as a threat. Uh, the U.S. has uh, created a, an executive order that's in the process of being implemented. And uh, there's also been proposed policy that's specific to open source software. So we're watching with interest. Uh, there's been some level of participation by uh, the open source community, but it's been somewhat limited. So we're, we're trying to make sure we, we uh, participate in those conversations. Uh, and the European uh, Commission has actually uh, approved an act called the uh, Cybersecurity Resilience Act. And I can talk a bit more about our concerns at the end of this. The, the Delicate Balancing Act is that we're incredibly supportive of achieving the goals of security, but some of the lack of understanding of how uh, open source software is built sort of threatens to break the thing that they hope to preserve. And then coming around the corner uh, with the rise of AI, we'll expect that there'll be much more public policy created in addressing uh, the use of AI uh, in, in respect to security and privacy for consumers. But we also have a tremendous number of uh, open source licensed uh, tools for AI and machine learning. And uh, without a, a deep understanding of how licenses are different than data and data has its own challenges in terms of being open and such, uh, it's something for us to make sure we're participating and uh, paying attention to uh, policy concepts as they're developed. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, one of the most encouraging trends is seeing more use of open source in philanthropy and research, and Cable's going to do a great job of doing a deeper dive into these topics. Uh, but we're, we're seeing that an increasing requirement, I did a study, and there are uh, an increased number of philanthropic organizations that are now requiring the code that might be funded through uh, their grants be released under an open source license. We've even seen that in the, in, the, in the federal government research. So it's a large trend in research in general. We also are seeing more uh, federal agencies uh, making inquiries about open sourcing that they have as resources. So NASA is an example where there's an RFI open today to asking the resource community to help them identify and prioritize which resources would be of value. And then the last piece that's really important, uh, especially in philanthropy, and Cable will talk ab about this, I think, in his upcoming discussion, uh, is that the coordination that's being done through the United Nations to achieve their uh, sustainable development goals and, uh, and using uh, open source as a key strategy. And I'll talk about it in a bit more in the next slide. You want to move to the next slide? Thanks. So uh, this is a, an incredibly important project to me that, that uh, stands on its own and lives outside of whatever uh, public policy that's uh, been developed, which is the Digital Public Goods Initiative. And one piece of that initiative under the uh, UNICEF was to consider and re refine a way to classify software as digital public good. And that was achieved last year uh, by creating a registry and a process to certify uh, open source projects as digital public goods. I was really pleased to be able to help them define that. And I think this is an important project that will help sustain critical projects that uh, aid underserved countries, that help with economies, 
uh, that support uh, humanitarian aid and, and other uh, public benefit projects. Go to the next slide. So what it keeps me up at night with all these things? Well, the one thing that we talk about quite a bit uh, within the open source community is sustainability concerns. Uh, the Para Foundation certainly understands that because you know what it takes to keep a global village going, to, to sustain a community, to make sure you have sponsorship. But there's also a challenge uh, in general, in the, in, and this goes back to the public policy development, is that there are opportunities for uh, for commercial interests to uh, tilt away from uh, an environment where open source can thrive. When my son was 17, he attended the University of Washington in Seattle, and he sent a book to me, and he sent a copy of this book called, uh, called uh, the title was uh, uh, When Corporations Rule the World, which was a great treatment on what the global economy was about and how uh, originally, especially in the United States, uh, uh, corporations were established as public good. They were allowed to organize in a way and have some governance that was different than a regular company because it was assumed they were working the public benefit. And that's tilted away. So the influence uh, in, in, uh, in governance is now tilts more toward corporations. We don't have a big political conversation about corporate influence, but we're seeing that in, in, uh, in another layer with the open source ecosystem. We see it show up in areas where uh, venture capital uh, now investments now go to companies that figure out a way to tilt or, or uh, uh, change license agreements uh, and come up with new uh, open core uh, server-side licenses that aren't uh, preserving the rights that are normally withheld for open source software. And so that's a, that's a level of concern we have because there's there is uh, there's an in creating this positive public policy around open source and software in general it creates an opening to create confusion and undermine our ability to be able to sustain our uh, our, our uh, software ecosystem and what I would refer to as strip mining where uh, uh, large companies are uh, enjoying the benefits of open source, but preserving the rights and the benefits for themselves and not giving back. That's a sustainability concern, and it ties into public uh, policy. I want to talk about global crisis and governance. Uh, we've seen over the years in a, in a global way, and I'm going to speak in general terms, but we can all think of examples where uh, governments aren't necessarily uh, uh, working in uh, for public benefit the way they're intended on paper because of the influences of, of large players. And a lot of policy development happens behind closed, closed doors, which is my third comment, which is around how we design public policy. So to give you a couple of examples, the, uh, the, the uh, Cybersecurity Resilience Act was pretty much developed behind closed doors for nearly a year. And the language of the act was only released till just before it was about to come policy. And in one respect, the, uh, the European Commission tried to ho hold uh, open source harmless and find a way to, to preserve it and keep it from the onerous burdens of the act. The act is mo itself is modeled on uh, uh, safety for public and consumers. That's a model for hardware, and a lot of the requirements to do things like be able to, you know, to certify and product recall are things that may serve to break the open source community. Now, the language of the bill was actually based on U.S. legislation, and the U.S. legislation and the the act was actually uh, pulled back the supply chain and uh, uh, supply chain material, uh, supply chain S bomb supply. So, sorry, software bill of materials and other supply chain concepts were actually pulled out of the bill recently before it was enacted because uh, it, the industry was able to explain that it would actually, they just weren't prepared to do that. But in the meantime, in Europe, they adopted that language and it passed because they never spoke to anyone in the open source ecosystem. They never spoke to developers and never spoke to foundations and they, they're now looking at revisiting that whole act. So those things keep me up at night. And I, uh, I, I'm personally working on an effort 
to uh, uh, bring together uh, nonprofit foundations that don't have a, uh, a chair at the table. Uh, right now, it's chiefly member driven organizations that represent industries, and they need to have a, a seat at the table too. But we need to make sure that uh, interests that are in the public benefit around open source are participatory in these conversations. So there's my opening comments, and uh, I'll turn the program back over. All right. Thanks, Deb. I think that was it. Uh, let me pull up Cable. Your... All right. Well, uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, th thanks, everybody, for the kind invitation. Um, uh, Deb, thank you for your comments. Uh, it's a real pleasure to to meet you and listen to the amazing work that uh, that you're doing. Uh, and as you were speaking, it's uh, it's nice to hear that there's a lot of synergy between what you're doing what, at OSI and what we do at uh, Creative Commons. So it makes me think we should talk more than we do. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Cable Green. Um, uh, I think I know several of you that are in the room. Uh, Clint, hello. I saw uh, several other friends. Um, I'm an old timer at CC. Creative Commons just had its 20th anniversary. I'm going on 12 years at Creative Commons. Uh, I was the director of open education for many years. I was CEO for a while, and now I'm the director of open knowledge. So I oversee our work in open education, open science, uh, open access research, and some in open data as well. Uh, we also have a whole wing of CC that works on open culture and the, the open knowledge and open culture are kind of our two big program branches, in addition to all the work we do around the licenses and the public domain tools and policy work, et cetera. Uh, so it was hard to, it was such a uh, broad and kind invitation that Patrick gave, um, hard to pick something to talk about, but um, I thought I'd start with a broad theme and then dive a little deep. Uh, so broadly speaking, uh, CC, as I mentioned, is just turned 20. Uh, while it's fun to look back at the last 20 years and, and celebrate, uh, what we're more interested in is looking forward to the next 20. And as we <clears throat> ask what should Creative Commons do and, and what where can we be the most helpful in the next 20 years, uh, one of the strategic directions that we've uh, that we've looked at and settled in on is to help solve the world's biggest problems. And so I would say for this conversation, really the theme is um, where does open, uh, open source software, open educational resources, open access research, open data, open hardware, uh, where does open have a role to play in making things better in society for people, for the environment, uh, for things that we care about? Uh, and where can open do better than closed can. And so that's uh, kind of the, the big framework for, for this conversation that I want to have today. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Monica Granados, uh, is our open climate campaign manager, and she and I co-created these slides. So I always want to give proper attribution. Uh, <clears throat> and these slides, uh, uh, Patrick will share them after they're all under a CC BY license. So as I, as I said, we kind of started with this question, what are the world's uh, greatest challenges? What are the biggest problems that, uh, that we face, that the globe faces today? And while there are many lists, the one that we've settled in on, and as many others have, are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, if you're not familiar with these, you probably are, but you can just go to uh, your favorite search engine and type in UN SDGs and they'll pop right up. <clears throat> these are a set of goals that the world's governments have decided to uh, work on collectively and as individual countries uh, with the goal of making significant progress and or solving some of them by the year 2030. Um, that, of course, is coming up soon. Um, but these are uh, these are meant to be, quote, a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now into the future. And so most of the UN's uh, activities these days uh, and uh, and the sub agencies of the United Nations, uh, entities like UNICEF, UNESCO, FAO, and others, uh, most of their work is, if not all of their work, is framed around the context uh, and uh, of the SDGs. And so these are the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you can see there are uh, 17 of them. Although number 17 uh, is is we should all work together. Uh, this is not. Uh, given that we've all agreed to these goals collectively, there's an opportunity to collaborate uh, among and across countries. 
Um, but you'll see uh, the big challenges of the day here. Uh, you know, my, my background's in number four, uh, making sure that everybody in the world has uh, access to uh, and can fully contribute to uh, education opportunities. Uh, but pick your favorite uh, challenge, right? Number 13 is one that I'll talk about today and uh, number 15 and 14 a little bit as well. Um, these are these are the world's biggest challenges. And so at CC, our, our question was, um, what, what's our role in helping to solve these? And what, if any, role does open generally have to play? So so why do this? Uh, why connect uh, open education, research data, software, hardware to the SDGs? Well, uh, let me let me pull out. Uh, we'll pull out climate change and research just as an example. Uh, Deb mentioned that during the pandemic, there was a real acceleration um, in the use and uh, I would say awareness of open. Uh, and we saw exactly the same thing. Mainly, this was around uh, open science and uh, uh, and the open research and the research data around COVID. Uh, governments, there was obviously an urgency. It was top of all of our minds. It was also the top of every government's mind around the world. And governments realized very quickly uh, from their chief scientists and others that the, that the majority of the research uh, was closed. And so if you look at the climate change uh, and the biodiversity preservation uh, research uh, from 1980 to 2020, 57% of that research is in uh, closed journals where you either have to pay a significant subscription fee at your university or institute to get access to that research, uh, or you have to go and you hit a paywall and you're more likely than not paying somewhere between 50 and 60 US dollars to access a single article before you even know what the article's about. Um, and so that, that was a real challenge and governments uh, simply said, this is unacceptable. Uh, we have to have the research uh, about COVID out there immediately. Um, and uh, and there was a push on the commercial publishing sector to release, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, in some cases, the, the openness was permanent and it was done with uh, Creative Commons licenses and CC0 or the public domain dedication on the data. Uh, but in many cases, uh, Elsevier and others gave temporary access. Uh, I wouldn't call that open. Uh, but temporary access in many of those articles have since been closed. And so it was a moment in the world where the world's governments, I think awareness was raised <clears throat> that if you want to solve, in this case, uh, COVID-19 and make vaccines faster and have better data about populations and have better information about variants and what was happening, and it was all happening very fast and it was happening at scale, that the only way to do that science well was to do it openly, uh, to hamstring and tie our hands behind our back with, uh, with closed processes, uh, with proprietary licenses, with all rights reserved copyright, uh, was not going to accelerate. Those were only barriers that impacted and slowed down the pace of progress. And so um, back to our question, what should we be doing for the next 20 years? Uh, we started looking at uh, climate. And, uh, and the same thing happens uh, with climate change research and educational resources uh, and data um, as happened with uh, COVID. Much of it is closed. Uh, this is just a, a graphic that shows that we've got these big barriers, right? Sometimes the barriers are uh, article processing charges where you don't pay subscription fees to, uh, to climate or biodiversity research. Uh, but you have to pay an article processing charge or an APC. Uh, these can run anywhere from on the low end, 250 US dollars, which are somewhat reasonable, uh, to the very high end can run into uh, several thousands and in some journals uh, up to eight to ten thousand dollars to submit a single article. So while uh, sometimes read access is getting better, the ability to contribute or submit one's research uh, are now hitting walls. Uh, and so this is, uh, again, if you want to do science, if you want to do research, if you want to share software and make iterative improvements uh, and fix bugs, uh, the more that we allow these walls to be in the way, uh, quite simply, the slower the progress is in solving these, these global challenges. And so we boil all that down at Creative Commons to this, this one simple phrase. Uh, if we're going to solve the world's biggest problems, the knowledge and the culture about them must be open. 
And so uh, we, we used to just say the knowledge about them must be open. We've added culture recently uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the knowledge seems to be fairly obvious to people. Uh, if you want to work on climate change, well, of course, the research and the research data needs to be open. It seems a no brainer. Of course, the large climate data sets from the uh, weather satellites needs to be open. Uh, of course, the educational resources that teach people about uh, climate change so that they can themselves make different decisions and have smaller carbon footprints and educate their families and their communities. Of course, the educational resources need to be open. Of course, the software and the hardware. Uh, there's some very interesting work happening with open hardware and open source software uh, now as people are building uh, devices for citizen science activities where you can uh, check the pH level in the water or temperature that are uh, that are open hardware plans and, and software that goes with those uh, open hardware to actually be scientists in the field and contribute that data uh, back to uh, environmental protection agencies and, and others in, in various countries. Uh, but what about culture? Um, our, uh, our argument here is that uh, these, the, the SDGs are uh, people made problems and therefore they're going to need uh, people solutions uh, in many cases. Uh, and in some cases, lack of our activity in the world uh, to, to resolve. Uh, but those are cultural issues. Um, they, if we don't understand uh, people and our cultures and our history, uh, our ability to affect the future um, is uh, we only are fighting with half measures. Um, having the knowledge about climate change isn't enough if we don't also understand uh, the politics and how people are making decisions and how their uh, different cultures are approaching uh, climate from different aspects. If we don't understand how uh, underserved communities or, uh, or how uh, our colonial past uh, has created um, underserved communities around the world that have been subject to extraction uh, by capitalism and by particular countries, and they're suffering the most right now because of, uh, because of the effects of climate change. If we don't understand those cultures, those histories, um, those peoples, that indigenous knowledge, uh, then the knowledge isn't enough. And so we're making a concerted effort to uh, certainly open up all the knowledge, uh, but also the culture about these uh, challenges and the solutions as well. In this particular case around climate, uh, we built a coalition. So the coalition is Creative Commons, Spark, and Eiffel. Uh, and there are two uh, funders that are backing this project, both the Open Society Foundations and the Arcadia Fund. We're very grateful to both of them. Uh, what we've uh, built uh, and launched just a few months ago is a multi-year campaign uh, to promote open access to research, to accelerate progress towards solving the climate crisis and preserving global biodiversity. We call this the open climate campaign. While opening up the research and the research data is the, the focus of the campaign, we are also working to open up uh, the educational resources, uh, climate data sets that are not directly related to the research, uh, uh, wherever we can, uh, open uh, software, uh, open hardware, uh, and other uh, other uh, content and code that, that may be useful uh, to people as they're working on climate solutions. Uh, I won't go through all of this in detail. If you want to see the detail, uh, you can find it at Open Climate uh, Campaign. Uh, actually, let me just drop the, uh, the link in here. It's uh, openclimatecampaign.org. Let me see if I can drop this in the public chat. There we go. And uh, But I will say uh, I'll focus in very quickly on number four, five, and six for these, uh, these goals that we have. We mean to change the rules on the policy and therefore the money. And so we will be working with national governments. We will be working with funders, mainly uh, big foundations. Uh, groups that are involved with the 30 by 30, for example, uh, and with the world's largest environmental organizations. <clears throat> and when we say we're working on open access policies, we will help them uh, create, we will help these policies get adopted, and then we will help them uh, implement uh, these policies. And uh, the policies will be to uh, wherever we can get them uh, to require that all, in the cases of governments, all publicly funded uh, research, all publicly funded educational resources, all publicly funded data sets uh, will be open by default. 
uh, with research by open, we mean CC by on the articles, CC zero on the data for data sets, CC zero for educational resources, CC by wherever we can get it. Um, and then other, uh, as I've mentioned, other areas as well. So we'll be asking, are you funding software uh, in your create that is going to be working on climate as well? Uh, please reach out to OSI and work with them. Uh, on and uh, on the, uh, the the proper uh, open source software license that's going to make sense for your project, and so um, that's kind of the crux of the campaign is changing the rules uh, on the on the policy and and therefore on the money that's being spent uh, to work on climate. And no big surprise, there are there's significant money being spent on uh, on climate and and biodiversity preservation. Uh, if you missed it and uh, it wasn't broadly advertised, there was just a uh, one of the COP meetings, uh, we're all familiar with the COP meetings around climate change. This was a, a, a COP, uh, United Nations meeting around biodiversity preservation in Montreal. And there was a significant agreement uh, by the world's governments to uh, to work hard to preserve uh, biodiversity. Uh, we are pushing hard that they look at the UNESCO recommendation on open science uh, as, a, as a set of guidelines as, they're, as the governments are making decisions about where they invest and how they invest, and that everything that they put into these projects uh, be open, uh, especially because it's being uh, purchased with and sustained by public funds. Uh, just a, a little bit here, if you're interested in the climate campaign in particular uh, and want to learn more, you can uh, go to the website. You can also contact us. Uh, this goes, this email goes to me and to uh, Monica, who uh, who manages the campaign. Uh, and then my email, if you ever need to get a hold of me, is just cable at creativecommons.org. A uh, little acknowledgement quickly here for the uh, for the noun project. Uh, we use a lot of their images uh, as well, uh, all CC licensed. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Cable, and thank you, Deb. So um, we have lots of questions. <laughs> so I don't know if I've organized them in any uh, uh, logical order. Um, but here, let me uh, pull up my cameras again. Sorry. <laughs> Um, let, let's start with the t a couple that came through uh, the chat as you're speaking. Um, so I think there are some interest in uh, models for increasing ecosystem sustainability. Um, and I guess I'd expand that question to, to sort of three levels. Sustainability at the foundation level. So for example, Aperio or OSI or, or um, um, Creative Commons, and then at the project level, and again, that might be for Perio, it might be like things like Sakai, the LMS, or U Portal, things like that. And then also foundation initiatives, activities that the foundation is investing in, um, and it might be like the the um, uh, climate campaign that you just mentioned, or for the OSI, it might be um, OSI initiatives on policy or standards. So. Just some thoughts around sustainability, and that's not just funding. I think probably it includes governance and community development, that sort of thing. So that's probably a whole conference on sustainability, but maybe just some thoughts um, at those three levels from both of you. And um, Deb, let's start with you if you have any thoughts. Sure. Let's start with a small question. So, I think, <laughs> so top of mind for me, and I'm really glad Cable for making that comment about what we should work on together, you know, until, until we were at this event, I, I know intellectually that Creative Commons would be a great institution to partner with, but I haven't had any direct visibility recently to understand what they're working on. And I think a, a, a really strong strategy for sustainability in any of these three areas has to do with partnerships and partnering because there's tr tremendous strength and levering uh, each other's uh, resources and assets and elevating and and uh, socializing what you're working on. You know, I, I mean, to, to, to Cable's point about uh, about it taking, you know, uh, a lot of collaboration to do things to you know, these really thorny problems will only get solved by having people work together to solve them that don't naturally work with each other. And so I think we uh, finding the right partners uh, finding a way to get the word out of what what part of the universe's problems you're trying to solve and finding strength through partners with 
with, uh, I don't like using the word synergistic, but that have, you know, common goals, overlapping goals, I think is incredibly important. We'll never be able to outspend a well-heeled uh, in, intention to do something commercial, but we can work together to uh, amplify each other's efforts and be strategic about whatever our respective uh, program goals are. Abel, you want to take it from there? Yeah, I think that's well said, Deb. I'm just sharing um, a couple of links here that make your point. Um, none of us can do this alone. I think when it comes to sustainability, you know, part of it is, uh, in my mind, kind of obvious. Like we, we look at, you know, where where are the winds blowing? And so <laughs> the example I just gave in chat was um, Creative Commons is part of a group called Movement for a Better Internet. And part of what we're all watching right now is, you know, quote unquote, Web3 coming in and the metaverse and artificial intelligence is starting to take off in interesting ways uh, with the work that, uh, that some of these companies are doing. And yet we're seeing in many cases, uh, further enclosure of the of the web, we're seeing uh, new walls go up. Um, uh, one of my uh, favorite examples is uh, uh, libraries. So uh, public libraries and the Internet Archive is the poster child that works on this one. But public libraries depend on this idea that you can acquire a, a book or other resources, own that resource, and then share it. Right? That's that's the how public libraries work. And even the ability to do that is being taken away from us by the commercial sector, which wants to leverage a Netflix model where you don't own anything, you just lease. And the moment you stop paying a lease fee, you lose access to it. And so, um, I mean, I was just on my uh, device last night on my public library and uh, there were restrictions on uh, the ability for my public library to lend me a, a digital book, right? At least right now they have one-to-one -one where when they buy one book, they can lend it once. Uh, but even that's being attacked uh, right now uh, where they want to uh, charge the library for every use. And so the, the movement for the better internet is looking at a whole compilation of those challenges. And no, to Deb's point, no one organization can handle this on their own, nobody can go up against Meta and and challenge them. We simply are outgunned with lawyers, with money, with staff. Uh, but together, uh, we can have intelligent, strategic conversations. We can uh, we can have impact. And uh, as we we I mentioned the Open Climate Campaign today, uh, we intend also at Creative Commons to launch other multi-year campaigns against other SDGs. And we would never do any of those alone. We will be reaching out to other uh, like-minded open organizations for partnerships. And then we'll also be reaching out uh, for partners in the sector that we're working in. So for example, with the Open Climate Campaign, uh, we have uh, some, some of the world's biggest environmental organizations on our steering committee that are helping to guide us as we go through the campaign. Uh, if, if our next campaign was on I don't know, clean water is another one of the SDGs, you can be sure that we would be partnering with the world's organizations which are working on that topic. Uh, and so I think that's both strategically wise, it also happens to be a good way to get funding for these activities. Because when you go in partnership, you're going at scale, you're going with more, uh, more credibility uh, you don't have the weaknesses that any one organization has. You can kind of uh, co collectively, you're stronger. Um, these all sound like cliches, but when you're talking with the funders, um, it's, it's, I can tell you, it's, it's meaningful. There were things that Spark could do that Creative Commons couldn't. There are things that Eiffel could do that neither of us could do in Africa, for example. And uh, collectively, we made a much stronger funding pitch than any of us could have made alone. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm feverishly writing notes, so I apologize for my delay. Um, so we can take these back to our board um, for ongoing discussion. Um, looking back at the public chat or the chat there, there was a question. Um, 
Uh, based on Deb, your last uh, slide, the things that keep you up at night um, and some of the uh, topics there. Um, oh, geez, let me get that. Um, and it's sort of a question about um, wondering whether, and we, and I don't know if that's a perio or broader um, open initiatives and organizations and foundations, ought to be um, uh, imaging a few of these possible futures uh, and put them out there for provoc provocative purposes, for provocation purposes. Um, and I think that's, you know, sort of around the idea of, of how do you engage with uh, organizations whatever they may be, who will be impacted, but may not be paying attention. Um, and so how do you solve yeah, this engage with yeah, them? So I've been, I've been giving some, that's quite a bit of thought uh, since uh, the US policies came out. And uh, the, the most influential organization uh, in considering and developing that policy represents a, a large consortium of industry. But what, what's missing, and, uh, and the US government's intent uh, in a, a perfect world is to make sure, and they, and they mean this in earnest, they want to ensure that they have the broadest number of stakeholders at the table who can both inform policy development and also predict you know, what the impact of implementing it might be. And so in the, the uh, use case in the US uh, for cybersecurity, the Linux Foundation has become the go-to organization because it is technically a nonprofit organization. And they have a lot of people they can easily bring to the table for the discussion. So it creates the appearance that, uh, that there's broad stakeholder representation when there really isn't. That's not a criticism of the Linux Foundation. They're, they're meeting their charter they're representing their members. But I think it's also a deficiency in assumption by policymakers of, uh, and they don't understand that wide uh, swaths of the open source ecosystem are missing. The nonprofit foundations, the 501c3 public benefit foundations that are working in the public interest, rather you know, by charter and tax code. And I apologize to folks that aren't from the US because it's a very US centric uh, example, but it's, it's easy for policymakers to be under the misimpression that they're they're speaking to the world when they're actually speaking to a single institution, so I have been working with uh, a, a, quietly so far with a number of uh, nonprofits, and I'm exploring setting up uh, this as a project under uh, a nonprofit uh, pro democracy uh, foundation in D.C. to actually formally create a consortium of uh, of underrepresented, underserved huge pieces of the open source ecosystem to formalize giving giving a voice uh, we're not lobbyists we uh, we don't we don't we don't lobby but we educate and inform the intent isn't to uh, uh, produce or recommend recommend new legislation but to be a resource to make sure that the legislation that's being developed is well informed so that that's my idea for today I want to pursue and uh, I'm sure after, after the meeting, I'll, I'll approach Cable about this idea too, because it's not going to be just, you know, developers as a software, but it's all those adjacent fields. It's open research, it's open AI, it's open hardware. Uh, those, those areas are not well represented uh, right now in policy discussions. And, the, and those can also confer into the European um, theater as well, where the, that's where you see the most significant policy that will really have a global impact as much as Europe is is developing a policy for its for its own regionality. The fact of the matter is open source is, is, a, is a global concern and and the policies that are made by either institution are going to have broad effects. So I think it needs to be better informed. So thanks for the question. Let me stand on my soapbox for a minute. Now, it's important that we stand on the soapbox. Uh, and Deb, yeah, I think you're spot on. That's our experience as well, is that when we work with governments, they, in many cases, the government and the staff that are running the process are pro-open, but they have to publicly be neutral in all of their opinions and their statements. And when we speak with them privately, they will aggressively say to us and to other open orgs, we need you to make comments. We need you to show up. We need you to bring your coalitions. We need you to send letters because if you don't, then you know 
then Elsevier was the only one that was here or Microsoft or whoever was the only one that was here. Uh, and, you know, we need those voices. And when we have the open community's voices, we can do something with that. And that's a that's a responsibility of ours. That also takes resources. And so, you know, the conversation, Patrick asked about sustainability. I think part of all of our conversations with our funders and with our members or wherever our money comes from is to be clear about, we try to lay out logic models at Creative Commons. Like, you know, you, you give us money, here's what we do with it. We're sending somebody to Washington, D.C., or we're sending somebody to Paris, or we're sending somebody to The Hague or to Brussels, and here's the conversation we're having. We hope to have this impact and this particular policy. And it, it's hard to explain the long game sometimes uh, to folks, but they get it if you take the time to walk them through. And it's it's tricky. It's not easy to find the right funder who believes in that kind of work. Uh, but a lot of this work is is long game work. Uh, it took us. We're now seeing open science breakthrough, and a big part of that was the pandemic. Yes, but it was also twenty years of really hard work, uh, and and writing you know international recommendations and being at the meetings and. And that all takes uh, staff from all of our organizations uh, working hard and, and working collectively and smarter. Thank you again. Sorry, still typing. Um, that's why I see you have a um, couple questions in there. Can I can I uh, ask you to maybe um, go through that because it looks like you're trying to be helpful and and provide sort of bullet points, but I want to make sure I get it right. So rather than me messing up, maybe you can just uh, go ahead and take the mic and answer. Is that okay? That's perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, um, just let me know if I'm dominating the conversation, uh, but I'll just fire it away. Um, so for Deb, um, you've, you've been part of many organizations and um, kind of selfishly for the for a period, I'm just wondering uh, what were some tools or, or methods or models that you followed for maintaining long-term health um, and vision in those organizations? That's a great question because I've had really mixed results within the same organization. Uh, the, we, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. The Open Source Initiative had been around for a decade and was all volunteer board run. They didn't have any professional staff. And we had to spend some time training the board away from being engaged in operation and actually hire professional staff. So one of the things I've learned in every institution I've worked in is that if, if, if something is to be sustained, it has to be resourced. If you can't find a way to resource it, then maybe it's not relevant. But we found it hard to believe when I joined the OSI board in about 2007, I think I've been on the OSI board like eight out of the last 10 years. I was the last person to be appointed to the board before they started doing uh, memberships. And then every time I tried to leave, I was asked to stay. And the, 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 the continuity of leadership and, uh, and re resourcing, even though it's not big, has very small staff, has an executive director, has someone who's responsible for fundraising. I'm part-time doing their policy work. Uh, which is underwritten by Eclipse Foundation, also having you do their policy work. Uh, so I think that you you have to find a way to be able to to resource to have a uh, uh, governance that is uh, is focused on long term vision and policy. And sometimes you have to train the leadership that are in the organizations uh, and those swings. So that's that's really important. I have to say, govern, govern, governance is very important. Sustainability around dedicated resources is another uh, key element to sustain any of, of the organizations I've been with over time. Thank you so much. Um, then there's a few more if I can just um, uh, uh, steal some time. So uh, just a general one would be, uh, do you have any opinions on where we are in the cycle of decentralization to centralization? Are we still on the, um, what would I say, the trend to centralize and the trend to put behind walls? Or is it can you see if we've gone over the over the top of the curve and on the way back to decentralization? So briefly, and then a cable can weigh on this one too. Uh, in in information technology, they've just been these huge swings back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I have to tell you that I think that uh, that decentralization is here to stay for myriad reasons. 
uh, the world learned we can actually do more in a decentralized manner, like building important software during a pandemic. Uh, open source software development and the model itself is decentralized uh, and that can't change. That's one of the reasons some of the public policy is difficult to implement because open source is always decentralized. And I think that uh, that's that's more likely to stay than not. I think we're going to think we're done with a paradigm shift in the way software is made. We're talking that context. I think we'll see uh, decentralization is here to stay and we'll keep experimenting how to get, how to get better at that. What do you think, Cable? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think you're right. I think I think it swings and I think it's um, the pendulum is at different points in different open communities. Um, another way, another space where it swings is in uh, open educational resources, uh, swinging between we need our own OER repository and tools and platform to, boy, wouldn't it be nice if there was one or at least one federated search where I could see all of the open educational resources on the planet. And there's pros and cons to both. And th that's currently swinging as well. Um, I guess uh, creative at Creative Commons, we take a more of a neutral uh, try to uh, uh, try, we try to have a helpful stance to this. So the when when things are open, when they're openly licensed, uh, the ability to fork and decentralize and innovate uh, can happen, and uh, we are big fans of that. And so that works, that idea works its way into the advice that we give around license choice uh, wherever possible in policy. We try to encourage more permissive licenses. And when I say more permissive, I mean fewer restrictions on the license uh, because there's more downstream remix opportunities uh, among, among licenses. Uh, and, and because of that public domain wherever possible, uh, because it can be remixed with anything, uh, and th I would say that uh, stance is both very practical for uh, for the individual user. It's also um, uh, it, the one of the arguments is higher return on investment for the funder. So, for example, the Hewlett Foundation requires a CC BY license on uh, what their grantees produce. Uh, one of the reasons they do that is their impact for every dollar they spend is significantly more than it used to be. It used to be they gave grant money to one grantee. And that grantee would hold copyright and would do something good for the world, but it was limited to the range of what that grantee could touch and affect. And when, now that things are CC BY licensed, they, they can go all sorts of places and they can be translated and they can be remixed and altered and changed. And the, the power of the ability to adapt, um, we believe is, is powerful in many <laughs> open spaces. And so that would lead I think toward favoring decentralization. Um, when when things get centralized, when there's only one type of policy, when there's only one um, you know one way to do things, uh, we innovation drops. And just to state the obvious, and so I think given a choice, we tend to lean toward decentralization and innovation. Francois, was that it, or did you want to have a couple others? In terms of time, I uh, thank you so much for your time, um, and it's a lot to 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 unpack and, and reflect on. But thank you so much for that. Well, it is nine fifty eight, and I have literally twenty one more questions that were sent to us, so I don't think we have the time. But um, I will use those questions to help uh, frame our next um, session. Um, I'd like to thank Deb and Cable for um, again taking the time. Uh, to work with us to help Aperio in its uh, ongoing um, sort of reflection and planning for uh, the future. Um, great content. Um, the number of people and the number of questions highlight that uh, it's great to see our community so engaged. Um, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone as well that um, the three initial uh, meetings here um, uh, we'll have one February 1st, and then a week later on February 8th, uh, we'll be inviting other folks, um, uh, still confirming those. Um, but again, thank you to the board for opening this up to the broader Aperio community. Um, I, I'm looking over the list here, and we see project leaders and community managers and folks from across all of our projects. It's great to see. Um, and again, uh, great information. I was. 
feverishly typing as, as uh, you both were talking to capture it all. Um, so thank you both again. And um, I think the, what I got from this is uh, building, uh, building communities. And uh, I definitely think uh, there's room for a period to engage uh, more deeply with both Creative Commons and OSI. So hopefully this is not a one-time discussion and um, looking to the future, we'll be able to find some areas where we can work together to to what I think is really worked hard, our common vision of more open collaborative uh, communities of practice. Um, so thank you again, both. Thank you to everyone else. Um, we'll follow up with uh, how to get the recording. Um, and I'll just leave, a, leave it on the table. Anything last, uh, Deb and Cable want to say? Go ahead, no, I just I just want to thank you for introducing me to Cable. <laughs> and in all seriousness, though, it, it, this is just a great example of being able to build upon each other's work and 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 spark new ideas. And, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you, the Aperio Board and 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 community for inviting us. And likewise, thank you for introducing me to Deb. It's good to have uh, new friends in the right places. Uh, I, I agree. I think, uh, you know, Patrick, I think going forward, there's, uh, there's, we, we've talked about collaboration a lot today among open organizations. I think we need to do more of that. Uh, I think the, uh, the open source software community isn't talking, uh, and vice versa enough with the open education community who isn't talking with the open access research community, who's not, not in conversations with the open science and the open data communities. And, uh, our power is in the collective. And so I think we need to find uh, spaces and ways to come together. Uh, I will invite all of you, uh, Creative Commons is uh, moving back to face-to-face -to -face summits. Now that we're a little bit past some of the worst pandemic, uh, we'll be in Mexico City, October three through six, three through five, three through six, something like that. Uh, so put that on your calendars. Uh, it, uh, that may be an opportunity and I'm sure there's other spaces uh, where your organizations are hosting meetings where maybe we could come together and have some strategic conversations around big things we want to do together and form up collaborations, go after significant funding uh, with those partnerships and solve some big problems in the world. I like the lead. <laughs> well, thank you again, both. And again, thank you to the to everyone that joined us today. Um, and I guess We'll say goodbye, or I'll say goodbye. Oh, I'm not on camera. I was waving. That was dumb. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody.